Michigan is going to give us a little bit of a character sketch about here. That phrase you use? So, yeah, like that. I'm not going to draw. He's not going to draw. I'm going <laughs> to try to verbally share that with us. So Shannon is a member of Second Mile, and we're really glad to have him share tonight. And he's going to be giving us what he knows from the word. All right. Thanks. I want to pray real quick before we dive in, and then we'll, uh, we'll get going. But uh, God, I just thank you for tonight. I thank you that we can be here. Lord, I pray that your word would really prick our hearts tonight. I pray that as we look into the life of Peter, that we would see some of ourselves in him. And Lord, as we see him grow into this wonderful, bold shepherd of the flock, the church of Jer in Jerusalem and, and around, Lord, I just pray that we would um, have that same heart to shepherd others and to be a friend and to be a mentor and discipler of others. So we lift this all up to you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things I get really excited about is I love to teach the Word. I've been involved in ministry a long time and I love to teach. But I can tell you um, we transitioned, our family transitioned out of a church in Tucson with the hopes of planting a church. And it's funny how God just seems to move you around into places you don't think you'll be. I'm a teacher now, and I coach, and so I have this, this thing where God has me in this place where he exactly wants me. But the excitement that I have about teaching, I can honestly say that when we were looking for a church, we had heard some friends talk about Second Mile, and I went online like I always do, and you know, I look at the mission statement, I look at the vision, the values, and everything about the church. But the, one of the first things I go to is, is the messages in, in here, and I just want to tell you how blessed I have been by being a part of this community and having Chad bring it every week. I mean, I don't think I have to remind you of this, but you have a great shepherd at this church with Chad, and it is a blessing to have him here and to be ministered by him every week. And um, we've been going through Second Peter. We spent, I think, three years going through First and Second Peter combined. I think it's been something like that. Not really. It's not quite as big as Exodus. But we've been going through First and Second Peter, and we're in Second Peter. So what I thought I'd do tonight, instead of continuing where Chad left off, I thought I'd do a character sketch of the Apostle Peter. Who was he? What was he like? What were his character traits? And we're going to see for a minute how Peter, as we look at a couple passages, one from 1 Peter in a minute and another from 2 Peter, the heart of a shepherd. The heart of a shepherd. And so, well, what's a shepherd? You know, we think about these dirty old men, you know, that, that are, you know, covered in manure and dust and they're out in the, the, the field, you know, the flocks. And the shepherd is used because the whole term of a shepherd is all about feeding and protecting the flock. That's what a shepherd did. The heart of a shepherd truly is to feed the flock and to protect the flock. And so we see Peter being a shepherd of the flock. We see him going from this fisherman into this bold shepherd. So what I want to do is read a passage from, first of all, from 1 Peter. Um, if you want to turn your Bibles uh, to 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5. I know all of you have this memorized, right? Because we, we spent a long time on this. I know you don't. I'm just kidding. But 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5. How many of you guys use the ESV Bible? And I know we typically use the ESV, and I, I talked to a couple people, and they said it would not be heresy if I used the NASB. That's just my, that's my thing, you know, the NASB. Not that I don't love the ESV, I just don't own one yet. I haven't broken down to buy one, but I will soon. So we're going to be in the NASB, um, starting in verse 1. Therefore, I exalt the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for a sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet is lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's interesting that Peter here is standing before his flock, and he is exhorting those amongst him to be shepherds of the flock. 
He's exhorting them to be shepherds of the flock. He is in a position of authority. And he, obviously we know he walked with Jesus, but he, he's here exhorting them. And so I want you to understand that Peter is in a position here. This is kind of like one of those movies, okay? Do you ever watch a movie where they kind of show the present scene and you're drawn in? And you're kind of wondering, like, how'd you get there? And all of a sudden, the little caption comes up, two years earlier. And then it goes back and starts to inflect. But that's kind of what this is. Here's where Peter's at right now. He's talking to the church, and he's exhorting the members, the elders there, to, to shepherd the flock. Okay, let's fast forward a little bit to 2 Peter. In 2 Peter 1, 10 through 15, we hear the heart of a shepherd. We have been talking about the reason Peter wrote the book of 2 Peter was because we had these, these guys, these false teachers coming in who were really trying to take advantage of the flock. And you see the heart of a shepherd right here. You see the heart of a shepherd protecting and exhorting the people saying, listen, don't. Don't give up. Remember these things. Remember these things. So this is where Peter's going. And you're going to hear the heart of a shepherd right here in the protection of the flock and exhorting them. And he goes in, starting in verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them, and you have, a, you have been established in the truth which is present with, with you. I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. Do you hear the heart of Peter? The heart of a, uh, of a shepherd. And in the Bible, a pastor and shepherd are, are very similar. They're, they're synonymous almost. But the heart of a pastor, a heart of a shepherd is to protect and to feed. So here we have Peter. So let's ask the question. Um, what led Peter from becoming a fisherman? If you remember, Peter was a fisherman. What led him from becoming a fisherman to transforming into this bold shepherd? Because we're going to take some snapshots of Peter's life in a little while. But what, here's what I wanted to do. Instead of resting in 2 Peter, I wanted to go back to the Gospels. I wanted to go back to the Gospel of John. And that's where I'm going to be spending a lot of my time in the message as we capture the heart of Peter, his character. So if you could turn to John 21. We're going to be in verses 15 through 19. And as you're turning there to give you the context, we're, it's John 21, 15 through 19. Okay, Peter, we know, was an impulsive guy. We know that he did a lot of crazy things. I think the motto of Peter's life was ready, shoot, aim. He was that kind of guy. I mean, he was impulsive. He just did things. And I think the reason that I love Peter so much, this is going to sound narcissistic, but the reason I love Peter so much because it's a lot like me. I am like that. I'm that kind of person. I'm very impulsive sometimes. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of my impulsive ventures in life that led kind of wrong. But Peter turns from this fisherman into a shepherd. And it starts in this story. So let's backtrack a little bit. Peter, we know, there was a time when he pretty much told Jesus that he would go to prison and die for him. And we remember the story that we're going to read it a little later, but we, we understand that Peter said that he would die for him and go to prison. But really what ends up happening is Jesus says, well, Peter, those are good intentions, but before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So imagine the scene just for a minute. Peter is there in a, in a, around a campfire, and people are accusing him. You were with that guy, Jesus. You were one of them. He's like, I'm not. I'm not one of them. And then he says it the third time, and the rooster crows, and it says that the Lord looked at Peter. The last time Peter sat around a fire is probably when he remembers Jesus looking at him and he wept bitterly. 
Now we come onto the scene where Jesus is walking around. He is after the resurrection. And we see here in this passage that Peter, he's out fishing. Why was he fishing? Because he's a fisherman. When he ran away and he wasn't around, he went to his default mode. He's a fisherman. He went around and he went to his default mode. So we pick up in verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, just, just to, sorry, back up just a second. Jump around a little bit. Just a, a little pause here for a second. I had this awesome weekend. I was gone from Friday until 2 o'clock this afternoon on a wonderful marriage retreat with my wife. And my emotions right now are a little bit raw. It was an awesome weekend. I had some great time to spend with my wife. So my wife says to me, make sure you speak slower because I know you're excited right now, so I'm going to slow down. But Peter, to back up the bus here a little bit, Peter has just eaten breakfast with Jesus and the disciples. Okay? So now we pick up. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, or said to him, tend my lambs. I know you've heard this story before, but I want to give you a little backdrop here. And I don't know if it's significant, if it was just stylistic or not, but in the Greek, the word love actually has three different words that's used for love. One word is agapao, which is this idea of this unconditional love without strings. And, th and then it's the love of the will. It's a choice kind of a love. It's not a feeling kind of a love. Then the other kind of love that's used is phileo which is the brotherly love. It's the kind of love that's based a little bit more on emotion. And the third kind of love, which is really not talked about, but is the, the word eros, where you get the word erotic from. And so it's kind of more of the lustful kind of a thing. But I want to point this out because it's really interesting. When Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? He says, Peter, do you agapao me? Do you love me? with all of your will? Do you love me without strings? Do you love me because, period? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. He doesn't respond with the same love Jesus asks him. He says, I love you, Lord, but it's a different kind of a love. And you'll see kind of how this, this interplay goes on. And then he says, tend my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me or do you agapao me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I phileo you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. So it, it's like Jesus is saying at this level, do you love me? And Peter, remember, Peter has denied Jesus three times. And I'm wondering if he's feeling some of that. I don't know. But here's an opportunity for Jesus to reinstate Peter. And he asked him the first time, and he asked him the second time. And I'm wondering what Peter's thinking right now. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. But then it goes, then it, then it, then it goes on further, and he, in verse 17 it says, And then he said to him a third time, and this is so beautiful because how many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. And here's Jesus saying to Peter the third time. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said it to him the third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. But what's really interesting in the third question, Jesus says, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter says, yes, Lord. And he says, well, tend my sheep. 
The reason I find this passing, passage so fascinating is because we have here Peter who denied Jesus three times. And I can just imagine the last time he saw Jesus over a campfire, it's when he had just denied him the third time and the rooster crowed and he saw Jesus gazing at him. And he must have felt some guilt. He must have felt some shame. But now he has this opportunity and the Lord embracing him. Jesus is pulling him in saying, Peter, do you love me? And they're on the same plane, the same level, the same understanding. Peter's like, yes, Lord, yes, I love you. And, but what's really interesting is that three times Jesus says, either feed my lambs or tend my sheep. So we have a fisherman who went back to default mode. Now he's being asked to feed the sheep. And I'm wondering what's going through Peter's mind right now. Does, does he even know what he's getting into? Does he understand what that even means? But the story gets thicker. Because here's Peter kind of feeling relieved. Probably a little bit like, okay, okay, I know I'm, I'm reinstated with Jesus. But it goes on. In verse 18, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he, spoke, when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. He just got done reinstating Peter. But, and he says, feed my sheep. And then he says to Peter, you know when you were young? Remember when you were young and you used to dress yourself? Well, when you grow old, someone else is going to dress you. And the, the idea of stretching out your hands, he knew exactly what that meant. It was symbolic for crucifixion. It was his way of dying. He was going to die a death. Jesus is predicting how, G, or how um, Peter was going to end his life. Think about that for a second. Peter was part of Jesus' inner circle. We know that he had 12 disciples, but among the 12, there was three, Peter, James, and John. Peter was there in the transfiguration. Peter was there in the intimate moments that other disciples were not. He was in the inner circle of hearing Jesus' heart about life, about ministry, and about his own death. He was there during the resurrection. He saw the glorious things that happened. But here's Jesus saying to Peter, you're gonna suffer a martyr's death. You're gonna die. And I'm wondering what's going through Peter's mind right now. Talk about a, a mission. Talk about a calling. So you see the connection? We see a, we see a man who used to be a fisherman, standing before the people in the books of First and Second Peter, bold, a shepherd. So Peter, it's, it's actually in tradition, it, you know, it's not in the Bible, but it's in some of the writings of the first century in tradition, that when Peter died a martyr's death, it was said that he couldn't even die the way Jesus died. He thought it would be dishonoring, so he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't even feel worthy to die the way the Lord died. So we see the heart of a shepherd. We see the heart, and it all started, I believe, at this moment. Jesus gives him the commission to feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed the flock. But Peter, you're gonna die a death that's not gonna be very nice. So Peter is, is probably flooded with all kinds of emotions right now. And the story goes on, and he's asking, well, what about the other disciples? What's going to happen to them? And Jesus is like, well, we're not talking about them. We're talking about you. Let's stay on task. Because Peter's impulsive. He's probably a little ADHD too. You know, he's probably like, oh, look, a squirrel. He probably had that in him, okay? But Peter, 
we see that he had this, this personality. The word Peter comes from the word Cephas, which means rock. What a name. Jesus renamed him Peter, which means rock, because he knew that he'd be solid. But he wasn't always that way. So we see this journey of Peter. So who was Peter? Okay, so I guess by profession we know that he was a fisherman. But what about his personality and character? I mean, here are some snapshots of Peter's life. So I don't know, how many guys have scrapbooks? I mean, I know it's kind of old-fashioned, old school, but anyone have scrapbooks? Okay, come on, humor me a little bit. Okay, now there's those embarrassing snapshots that get thrown in there, you know, the pictures when you were a kid and your mom's like, oh, this is so cute, and it's when you're bathing and you're like, you're not going to show that to anybody, are you? Only when you graduate, they say. So there's those snapshots in our lives. But if we could take a snapshot of Peter's life, of his character traits, what would it look like? Okay, so what I want to do is just describe some of the character traits of Peter then I'm going to ask you some questions and, and maybe navigate through these. But the first thing, Peter was impulsive. We know Peter was impulsive. We hear many stories about Peter being impulsive. The first one we know of him being impulsive was in, in Matthew 14, 22 through 33. You can write that down. The first one, that's where Peter walks on water. Remember the story where Jesus is on water and and he's, they're sitting in the boat, and if it's you, Lord, tell us to come out to you. And, and they're probably sitting there like, yeah. And then P Jesus goes, come. And Peter's like, oh, and he steps out of the boat. He's impulsive. He stepped out of the boat. Being impulsive is not always a bad thing, but he's impulsive. He stepped out of the boat. And I can honestly say that one of the reasons, I actually walked on water once. You're, you're, you're doubting me. I actually did walk on water once. Now, I can remember this story very well, because I almost died doing it. So, my grandpa, um, we used to go to this pool when I lived in Michigan. We used to go to this pool. And after we went to the pool, we'd always go to Burger Chef. It was this cool, you know, Burger King kind of place. I'd always get a cheeseburger and a vanilla shake. It was so good. We're in the pool. And you know those floaty things you put on your arms? I had this awesome idea. It was awesome at the time. Well, I decided that, hey, if I put these on the, my ankles, I could literally walk on water. So, you know, I don't, I don't know what my grandpa was doing. He was swimming probably with my brothers. And so here I am, you know, dismantling the things from there. And I put it on my ankles. And I'm on, I'm on the edge of the pool. And I took a step into the pool, got my other foot in. And it was really cool for about that second. Then all of a sudden, my body went whoosh. And I'm, and I'm, I'm I'm literally drowning. And I'm wondering if people are seeing these little floaty things with feet sticking up going, <laughs> whose kid is that? Someone save him. So anyway, that's my story about walking on water. It wasn't quite as dramatic as Peter's because, you know, Peter's was actually upright and he walked for a while until he looked at the wind and the waves. But I too am impulsive. Who does dumb things like that? Well, I got some more for you. Just recently, or I'll, I'll go back one. My first guitar came from being impulsive. It was so awesome. I went to this music store and they had these awesome musical instruments and I'm looking up on the wall and there's this guitar that I really liked. It was expensive. You know, it was in the hundreds or more. It was in the hundreds and looking at it and there's this great big sign. It said it's easier to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. I'm thinking like, that's a good idea. I think I'm going to get this guitar. So I bought the guitar and begging for forgiveness wasn't fun either because I had to talk to Lara and say, I'm sorry I bought this guitar with all of our money. Impulsive, right? You've done things like that? Okay, here's my recent venture. It doesn't get better with age, I guess. So here we are. We're going to Dairy Queen and we're sitting there in Dairy Queen and we're driving and all of a sudden I, I look at this alley, you know? You know the alleys where they put trash cans down? So I'm in the alley and I'm like, hey, I wonder where this goes. You know, so I start driving in the alley and we're going, and, and Laura's like, well, where are we going? I said, oh, I just wanted to see where this goes. This looks really cool. And we're driving, and, and all of a sudden, the, the, you know, we're taking all these turns, and the, and the alleyway keeps getting narrower and narrower with trees overgrowing the alley. And as we're driving, I hear <coughs> on the side of the car. And I'm, I'm kind of going, I can't back up. This is, this is not good, you know, and I'm, but I'm all cool, you know, I'm like, Oh, I just wanted to see where we'd go, you know, and I'm driving. And, and, and then we're going for a while. And then my youngest one, Ty, is like, 
Daddy, I'm scared. I'm like, be quiet. This is, we're good. You know, and, and so here I am driving. Impulsive. Did you ever do dumb things like that, being impulsive? Well, Peter did dumb things. He was impulsive, right? But there was something about Peter that God used in his impulsiveness. But also, being impulsive sometimes means that we, we get ourselves off track. So I have a couple questions to ask you guys to think about this as we think about being impulsive as we, our lives are transformed. Because we see Peter go from this, sh this uh, fisherman to this shepherd, but there was a transformation that happened. He was impulsive. So here's a question. Is your life more characterized by self-control and restraint or by impulse and self-gratification? This is hard. I mean, this is hard. One of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. We talked about adding to all this, this thing, you know, in Second Peter, adding to diligence, knowledge and knowledge, self-control. Self-control is a tough thing, I think, for a lot of people. So I guess the question is, is your life more characterized by self-control and restraint or by impulse and self-gratification? And these are things that you can think through on your own. And maybe you can talk about in your community group. But then the next question is, what needs to change or be confessed? I know I do some dumb things sometimes. And as, and as I reflect on those, I think about it. Because being impulsive sometimes can be exhilarating and fun. But at the same time, it can be damaging to others. And even though Peter's walking on water wasn't a huge deal, he cut off Melchus's ear in the garden. That's the, other, that's the other reference that I gave. He cut off a guy's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane because he was just impulsive. He does things like that. All right, so moving on. Uh, the next character trait that I, that I think really summarizes Peter, he was ambitious. He was an ambitious guy. He had a, great, a lot of great intentions. Um, we think about... Um, in Luke 22, 31 through 34, um, the Last Supper. And we, I kind of alluded to that earlier, where they're sitting around the table celebrating the last meal together. And he says, Lord, I'll go to prison for you. I'll die for you. Peter is very ambitious. He has great intentions. He had a really good heart to do the right thing. So he was ambitious. And you think of another scene in John 13, 5 through 11 in the upper room where they're foot washing. You know, when Jesus goes around and he takes off the outside of his cloak and he puts a towel around him and he starts washing their feet. And Peter's like, no, Lord, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus pretty much says, hey, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And, and what was Peter's intention? You should not be washing my feet. You're the God of the universe. I should be washing your feet. I think I probably would have responded the same way. We don't know what goes on in the heart of Peter, but he was very ambitious. And Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And Peter's like, well, wash all of me then. And then Jesus responds, well, you don't need a bath, Peter. <laughs> you don't need a bath, just your feet, we're good. Peter was ambitious. Some questions to ask. Do your aspirations for success line up with where God may be calling you? And what one area of ambition could God be calling you into service? See, I don't think ambitions are a bad thing at all. And, and even though Peter, his heart, his intentions, and the ambitions that we have are good sometimes, but sometimes our ambitions can cause us to run ahead of God. I know that's me. I get so frustrated with myself when I decide to do something because I'm excited about it and I don't even pray about it. I don't even, I, I don't even include my community group in it. I don't, I don't even include my wife in it sometimes. I just say, I'm just going to go for this. And the ambition sometimes leads us to where we run ahead of God or it might lead us down roads where we're not supposed to go. But ambition is not necessarily a bad thing, but we must always check our motives. I think that's the big thing, checking our motives. So the aspirations and the success, where is that leading you? And maybe God is using that ambition that's in your heart, that passion, that ambition. Maybe he's using it to do something significant in the kingdom. You know, maybe you're riding the bus 
and God is stirring in your heart to do something. Maybe you're leading a ministry or you're at a golf course or you're at a school and God is saying, this is a passion area of yours. This is an ambition that you've had and I want you to use it for my glory. So the ambition, pray about it. Ask what God wants you to do with that. It's a good thing sometimes. All right, and then another one, self-assertive. In Luke 5, 8, um, we hear about the calling of the first disciples. We know that these disciples were kind of knuckleheads. They weren't the creme de la creme people. They weren't the ones who were off at seminary. They weren't even the ones in the rabbinical schools. But these were just normal guys, blue-collar workers, out fishing. They were tax collectors. And in this scene, Jesus comes on the scene as Peter is fishing. And Jesus comes up to Peter, pretty much they're sitting in the boat, and he says, hey, Peter, why don't you throw your net on the other side of the boat? And Peter's response is, well, Lord, we've been fishing all day. We haven't caught a thing. And the paraphrase motive in, in brackets might be, duh, like throwing it on the other side of the boat's not going to work. But he's thinking like, well, Lord, we've been fishing all day. We haven't caught a thing. But because you say so, we will. Well, he throws the net on the other side of the boat, and they catch this miraculous catch. And it's so interesting, the response of Peter. He says, Lord, away from me, for I am a sinful man. Peter, at that moment, recognized who stood before him, the Son of God. And Peter, in his guilt and shame, realizes that that holiness and that sinfulness just don't seem to match. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever kind of cower away and feel like, Lord, away from me, for I am a sinful man? You know, it's really interesting that in life, I think we've all experienced pain, we've all experienced sin in our life where we start to cower away sometimes, but I just want to tell you something that when we sin, yes, it breaks our fellowship with God, but here's the thing. Self-condemnation, when we, when we hide and we condemn ourselves, that's a ploy of Satan to, to make us cower and shy away from God. But conviction from the Holy Spirit says, just confess. Peter was self-assertive. He understood his lot. He understood his sinfulness. He was honest about it. And he said to the Lord, Lord, away from, I'm sinful. You are amazing. I am sinful. And then in the other one is a story that I've already alluded to about how Peter denies Jesus. And it says after the third time, he heard the rooster crow. And the Lord looked at him it says he got up and ran away and wept bitterly. Peter knew. No one had to tell Peter, you screwed up. Peter, in his heart, knew what just went down. He wept bitterly. See, Peter was self-assertive. He understood where he was at in life. And to be honest with you, this is, this is a really hard thing, I think, for a lot of people. It's hard for me sometimes because we get so busy and we don't like to think about these things. But a couple of questions that I really want you to think about. I've been weighing, I've been thinking through this in my own head here. But questions are, have you taken an inventory of your life? And this next one's really tough right now. But it says, are you weighed down by guilt and patterns and sin that are preventing you from experiencing the fullness of Christ? I know it's a heavy question, but I think it's important as believers in Christ that we look at our life. Peter knew where he stood. You know, it's kind of like a filter on a pool. You don't clean it after a while, and what happens to the pool water? It gets nasty. And I think when we don't clean the filter in our life, and I don't mean we have it, we can do that, God does that. 
Because it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So all I'm asking in these questions is, have you had that chance to step back and take an inventory? Have you had a chance to look at those things in your life that seem to perpetually be causing you to be weighed down or maybe even hindering joy? John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to only kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And I think when we realize that we have things weighing us down, we're not going to experience that abundant life. And the thief loves, Satan loves to come in and point out flaws in our life. But here's the thing, we can just confess those and give those up to God. All right, now here's the, the, last, the last character trait that I think really we see Peter evolve into in the sense of he had this, but he started to master this a little more. But the last one is bold. Peter ran away, even though he was, you know, cutting off people's ears and he, impulsive and jumping on water. There was something about Peter as we read about him in the book of Acts. After Pentecost, it is Peter who stands up and delivers this beautiful sermon. It is Peter who does that in, in Acts 2, 14 through 36. But my favorite story about Peter in Acts is in Acts 3. Now, understand that beggars sat on these steps and this beggar sitting there asking for money. And Peter's there. And he says to the beggar, gold or silver I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. And he did. How cool is that? This fisherman who denied Jesus three times, who ran away after Jesus was taken away, he wept bitterly. This same Peter is sitting there and he says, what, I don't have money, but what I do have I'm going to give to you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And he did. You know what's really interesting about that story? It got him in a lot of trouble. Because we go to the next verse in Acts um, 8.20, and I'll, I'll pretty much be closing with this, but... He talks about, I'm just going to paraphrase because I don't have a whole lot of time, but anyway, um, Acts, he is standing there before all the teachers of the law, okay? See, I'm just like Chad, I run out of time too. It happens, it does, you know, there's a lot of good stuff here and you want to share it all, but you can't share it all the time. But Peter is standing before all the teachers of the law and they're accusing him, How, you, you, you uh, told this guy, don't teach about Jesus, don't do that. And he's, he's saying, what are we being on trial for? Are we on trial because we talk about Jesus? And he says, so be it. Because you know what? Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. If you're asking us to stop preaching about Jesus, it's not going to happen. And it says the men saw that they were untrained and uneducated. Interesting, huh? Peter was untrained and uneducated. He was, by their standards, in their educational system, he was untrained and uneducated. But the key phrase in there says, but they took note that he was with Jesus. And I find that absolutely amazing. Peter did not go to the rabbinical schools he did not do all the education. He did not finish his doctorate in theology. But yet, here's Peter standing before all the teachers of the law, and he's dumbfounding them. Why does this guy have so much boldness that he can stand before them and say, I will not stop talking about Jesus. Put me in prison. I don't care. Remember back in John, when, G when Jesus said, Peter... Your arms will be stretched out and you'll be led away. It was because of this boldness of Peter and the conviction that Jesus says is who he said he was. 
So, a question I have would be, for this boldness, where should you be bolder in proclaiming the gospel? Where are some places in your life right now where maybe God is asking you to be a little bolder in proclaiming the gospel? And then, I alluded, this before, alluded to this before about Peter being uneducated and untrained. And there's a question I want to ask from this whole standpoint of being uneducated and, and untrained. You know, we live in a culture, I think education is awesome. I, I'm a teacher. Education is a good thing. You know, I always tell people, education, you got to get some education. Education is a great thing. I'm, you didn't get the joke, sorry. Come on, stay with me here. Education is a great thing, but I think sometimes in our culture, we limit ourselves with our education. So here's a question I have for you. Would people take note that you have been with Jesus? And I think there's a couple slides up there. Yeah, there we go. Um, would people take note that you have been with Jesus? And then the next question, are you following Jesus close enough to gain experience in life and ministry? And here's the clincher, the last question. Are you relying too heavily on your training and education to open up doors? We live in a, we live in a city with an education system. Public schools, right? But we also have a college, a university here. U of A, a fantastic college that, that educates people, doctors and lawyers and nurses and, I mean, you name it, engineers. And education is awesome, but the question I have sometimes is, is it our education that puts us in the places where God wants us? Absolutely. But do we rely on our education? Or is it on the Holy Spirit? And do we need to be bold? Do we need to look at those places in our lives when God is saying, you know what? It's not your education that's going to open up this door for you. I am paving a way. There are impossible things, you guys, that, that God does sometimes despite our education. There are people who graduate, you know, from college. I mean, think of all the ASU grads. You know, they don't think that one day they'll be working at Burger King. <laughs> they don't. Sorry. I had to spend all weekend in Phoenix. And Tucson was the brunt of the joke. U of A, I just had to say it. It just made me feel better. <laughs> I, I'm back home now with U of A people. Oh, there's probably ASU people here. I'm sorry. You can send me the hate mail later. But the point is... I think that sometimes we can rely too heavily on our education. All right, so here's what I want you to do. Um, Peter went from fisherman to bold shepherd, okay? He had a transformation in life. He went from this place to this place. And I bet every one of us in this room can think of one of the character traits of Peter, the snapshots of life that put him exactly where he is in the church, okay? So... How, and this is something that I really want you to talk about in your community groups. I think this is something that we don't talk about enough. That how has Jesus changed your life? Because I guarantee you, if Peter were standing here today, he would say, he was everything to me. I left my family to follow this guy. And I know that he was God of the universe in the flesh and that he died on the cross to pay my debt. How has Jesus changed your life? What snapshots from your life can you point to that led to amazing growth? I know we have struggles. I know there's pain in our life. But you know what? As a Christian, there's some great joys There's some great joys. And I think sometimes we don't celebrate enough. You know, like as a coach, it's so easy to look at losses and to tell the team what they've done wrong, right? I mean, you, you, it's hammer them. You didn't do this right, we didn't do this right. But you know what? We need to celebrate. When you get that win or you get, do that thing right, we need to celebrate more. And as a church sometimes, not this church, but I'm saying the church as a whole, I don't think the, the world 
sees us rejoicing enough. Rejoicing in what God has done in our life and seeing that growth happen. And then, um, I guess, how many of you have felt painful and, and the joyous? I mean, that's the times are both painful and joyous, but celebrate some of the joyous things in our lives. So as we come back now to the end of the movie again, right? We're back at the end of the movie again where we started. We see Peter, this bold, mature shepherd telling his flock, beware of these false teachers. Stand firm. Remember everything that was taught you. You can do it. Be shepherds of the flock. So that's the question. Where have you been? Where are you now? And who knows where you'll be in the future? But one thing's for, sh for certain, that God is in the business of transforming lives. I have seen amazing things happen in my life. And I'm really hoping at your community groups as we gather together that we talk about those areas, those benchmarks in our lives where God has done something great.